Well, welcome to the second of our special Zoom sessions for the Tennessee Higher Education Innovation and Leadership Fellows and for the University of Tennessee Executive Leadership Institute. It's wonderful to see all of you here. I'm not going to waste a lot of time uh, with the introductions. Uh, I think most of you folks know the four panelists that we have here and they'll provide an introduction themselves. Our host for this session is David Butler from Middle Tennessee State University. And with uh, no more ado than that, David, I'm going to turn this over to you. Great. Thank you, Bob. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on the time zone you are uh, within the state of Tennessee. I appreciate y'all attending today. It's great to see uh, this, the number of faces that have arrived. Uh, we have four presentations today all around uh, COVID-19. The presentations go from very personal uh, out to a little bit of a university unit to a full university unit and then to the full state. So it's scaling from individual to more of a global or statewide perspective. I would love to say we planned it that way. We created a template and got the best presentations, but the reality is the uh, people that volunteered uh, actually fell very nicely into these categories. And so I want to thank you know, in advance uh, Bruce and Frank and Stephen for taking out their time and uh, presenting today. Uh, ask if you could hold questions to the very end. Each of us will walk through our presentations. Uh, we'll lead each of ours individually. And at the end, uh, we'll host, uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you may have. The order is going to be Bruce uh, sharing his story. And I will uh, share my narrative, then Frank, and then we'll conclude with Stephen. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, have Bruce begin sharing his screen. Thank you very much, David. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here. And I hope that, uh, you know, throughout this talk um, that you do gain some good information as you uh, progress through your leadership and, and as, as you experience COVID in different ways. But uh, let me share my screen now and uh, let me know if you all can see that. Um, it's good. Yes. It's good. Okay. Uh, thanks again for having me. And um, I'm going to be brief and I'm really, uh, I'm really here just to talk to you uh, from a personal perspective. So. Uh, back in mid-July, uh, I was diagnosed with COVID. Um, shortly after that, uh, my wife was also diagnosed. And then um, we think eventually all the kids had it, but we're not really sure because uh, at that point they weren't tested, nor did the doctors recommend that they be tested. But um, so by no means, I realize that you probably know someone else who has this. And, and what I've realized from conversations uh, is that everyone's experience is greatly different. So this is just a small glimpse of what uh, myself and my family experienced. I hope that uh, by discussing this, that it helps you to understand a little bit more if you haven't been exposed to it, um, but also realize that it's just uh, just my experience. And, uh, and really, I think one of the scary things, and I'll get into it a little bit about this disease, is, is the variation, you know, because it goes all the way from no symptoms at all uh, to death. You know, in fact, recently um, I, I heard a story about one of our faculty members who has a sister who had COVID and um, from the onset of symptoms to death was, was four days. And um, all the way to my experience with some symptoms to others with none. So um, I feel very lucky um, that, that I had a mild, mild case but I also, I think, had a chance to experience what it was like, and hopefully those ins insights will help you. So um, as an outline, I'll go through the symptoms and then more of the mental aspects, the fear, the isolation, and then, and then end on some advice for yourself um, or as a supervisor or a coworker. So I hope that uh, you all take something valuable away from the experience. So here, here are the symptoms, and you, you know, one is from the, the CDC site, but um, what I put on the left-hand side is what my experience was. So, you know, I started and, and it was muscle, you know, muscle aches, 
And at first I thought it was something different because I had some back issues and I had taken ibuprofen and doctors were, you know, my creatinine levels and my, my uh, kidneys were a little bit high and then my lower back was bothering me. I go, oh, it's probably, probably related to that. And then of course the, the muscle aches went from the back to, you know, my entire body. Um, and then the onset of a, a low grade fever, the fever never went over 100.5. Um, and in fact, you know, I, pro I probably had it and didn't even realize I had a, a low grade fever and then, and then followed by chills. And then the, the other symptoms that, uh, came on and persisted for longer were the cough, the congestion, uh, shortness of breath and, and the fatigue. And, and it's very strange. It's, it's a fatigue that I never felt before. Um, when I just, somebody asked me, you know, how did you feel? It felt like. I had negative energy, if that's even possible. So you, you know, if I was sitting in my office or you know in my bedroom, it was it was a chore to you know get out of the seat. I mean that's how that it just felt like a, a mass, you know, a, a mountainous uh, task uh, just just to move sometimes. Um, luckily, that subsided. Um, so that's, that's the things I think that you, you know, at least I experience and, and you might want to consider if you have friends or family or, or colleagues that go through this is, uh, is those. But then the other aspect of it is really uh, mental. And I think that's even maybe more important to understand. Um, you know, these are physical symptoms that we all hear about, but there's a whole other side of it on the mental side um, that I think it's, it may be more important to understand. So what is that? So, you know, after, after I was diagnosed and I realized I had a low grade fever, I got tested and, um, and was positive. And then um, you start receiving calls from the health department. Some of you may have experienced this. And they ask you questions uh, about how you're feeling, what your symptoms are. And they always, they always end the call on, with that last quote I have on the upper right hand corner. And that call ends with, and if your symptoms get worse or you have trouble breathing, go to the emergency room immediately. So uh, in that, that may give you a kind of a feel for what the mental uh, aspect of that is because you almost feel helpless because it goes from, okay, I have COVID, I'm not feeling great. And then a big gap to feeling like you have nothing you can do to if it goes, if it gets worse or go, gets bad, I got to go to the emergency room. So, so basically, you know, fear and uncertainty take over your mind, I think, I think is the best way to describe it. So I found myself on a daily basis um, asking myself, am I, am I feeling more congested today? How's my breathing? Is it getting worse? And um, I have, I'm in a high risk group because I have high, I have diabetes and I have high blood pressure. And, uh, and I was warned by my, my endocrinologist, if you get COVID, um, you're, you know, you could be in big trouble and you'll go, you know, straight to insulin dependence. So I'm a type one, two, I have an antibody that someday I'll be type one, um, that I've kind of been a medical miracle and that uh, I've been producing, um, insulin, uh, using medication. But I was warned if I, if I was COVID positive, I would, I would go straight to insulin dependence. Um, and, and a bunch of, bunch of problems. So I would be asking myself as I prick my finger, um, you know, is, am I getting the high because of something I just ate or, or is this the beginning of something that's going to spiral out of control? So um, that uncertainty really, really gets to you um, over time and it's always there. So um, that's one thing I think if you talk to people that have it, you have to, you have to realize that there's a lot of uh, question marks. Then the other aspect that I think is also mental is the isolation. So when, you know, when I was diagnosed, I, I was um, uh, a few days ahead of my wife uh, being diagnosed. So I immediately um, started quarantining myself. And it's, you know, we're, we've been used to, you know, working from home and doing those types of things. But it's really strange. I think the strangest part is being quarantined from your own family, right? So I kept myself to the two rooms in my bedroom or in my office. And, uh, and then when I left, uh, left those two rooms, of course I would wear a mask and I would, I would distance myself uh, from the rest of the family. Um, 
And what you begin to realize are some of the little things that you miss, right? So, you know, hugs from the kids and that kind of thing. Um, and in some ways, that's a, it's a blessing. So, you know, I put a picture on the bottom right-hand corner because, you know, I have a 14-year-old daughter. I have a 17, 14, 15, and a 17-year-old. And my 14 year old still allows me to read bedtime stories to her, which is, which amazes me. And I know that, you know, as, as kids get older and they leave the house, that's not going to last for very long. And so I really, I didn't realize how much I cherished that until, you know, I had to stop doing that. And um, so you, you realize that this isolation with your family is, uh, is something that, that you notice some little things. So maybe in one way, that's a blessing. The other thing is, um, you know, then the whole family goes under quarantine and then um, everyone is a little bit antsy and everyone, um, you know, kind of gets tired of staring at the four walls. Even if you were going out uh, previously to you know, go to the grocery store and wearing your mask and doing stuff, but you're, st you're still out a little bit. But uh, when you're completely in lockdown, it's a, it's a little bit more of an isolated feeling. Um, so then I just wanted to turn a little bit to, to some advice. And... Uh, so I have advice for you as a, as a person who um, may have COVID or get COVID um, and things that help me. And then as a supervisor or an employee of the university, things that you might consider. So I think that the best thing for an individual is to stay positive and try to, try to stay positive throughout the whole thing. Because again, it could be um, uh, mentally draining because you you're physically tired, but also you're, you're worried that things might spiral out of control. Um, there are some lights at the end of the tunnel. Of course, as I felt better and better, um, I felt more and more positive. Um, we did things and it was really, really neat. Like we had, uh, we kept ourselves busy and we did a quarantine Olympics, for example. You know, my, my kids made up these games and we socially distanced and wore our masks and were able to... <laughs> kind of do, a, do an Olympics at home. So think about creative ways that you can uh, stay busy. The second one I have is rest. Um, but for me, because of the mental aspect and because I have uh, diabetes and was worried about being in a high risk category, uh, I wanted to keep busy. So I, you know, I kept working, but I found that I had to give myself permission to rest. So, um, and, and that's a lot, you know, allowing yourself to do that without feeling guilty. I'm sure that everyone in this class is in, is in ELI because you're probably a workaholic, right? And you probably really uh, work very hard at what you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, for me, that was a blessing. But I also had to make sure that it was okay for me to rest. And, and, I'll, and I'll point back to what, a, what that means as a supervisor in a minute. Um, our, our fearless leader, Bob, made a great recommendation. Um, I guess I was, in, I was in ELI when this happened and some of the assignment was due and, and I emailed Bob and I said, ah, oh, I got COVID and, and, uh, and then he suggested, uh, besides checking in on me, which was really nice, he suggested that I keep a log and write things down. So I did and, and in that log, I, I basically um, wrote a little bit about how I felt, which was really helpful. As, as things got better, because then I, I worried less. And then I, and for me, it was positive notes and scripture and things that, um, that would help me to stay positive. Thank you. So um, those are the types of things that I wrote in my log. So I think that was a great suggestion by Bob. Um, one I learned that I didn't realize uh, could have a, a really negative uh, effect is, uh, is a consideration of when you tell um, outside family members. So I didn't tell my, my sister or my dad for a while until I knew I was feeling much better, until I was, I, the symptoms uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the fever and the aches and, and, the, and I knew I was on the upswing. And I happened to mention to my dad who was, who just turned 93 actually. And uh, I, I reassured him, oh, everything is fine, it's, it's passing. And then uh, I got a panicked call from my sister that, uh, you know, dad is really worried. He was in tears. Um, you know, he thinks that you're not telling him the truth and that you're, you're really in worse off condition um, than you might be. So uh, be very careful if you have elderly parents. Um, you, and you don't want to cause too much uh, cause for concern. So I found, you know, I, I call my dad every day on the phone and I found that I was really trying to hold back if I had to cough or do something like that because 
he was very concerned and, and, and uh, you know, I didn't want to cause him any more anxiety than I already did. So if I, if I went back to do it again, I would have waited even longer um, to tell him uh, that I had had COVID. The next one, um, I really learned from a friend and we, you know, who had COVID and that was to get a, a pulse oximeter to monitor your, your blood oxygen levels. Because of the uncertainty and the unknowns of the disease, um, uh, I got it as I was on the upswing, but I really found it reassuring because, you know, the congestion and the coughing and everything always got worse at night. And I always went to bed thinking, oh gosh, is this the night it's gonna spiral out of control? But when I had this pulse oximeter, I could put that on my finger and get, and get an idea of what my blood oxygen level was. And if it stays above 92 or above, um, you know, the, the recommendation is that you're probably in good shape. So, if, you know, I, I was always in, in decent shape, but that gave me reassurance. So if I woke up in the middle of the night or if I felt like I uh, maybe wasn't breathing as well, I would check my, my blood oxygen level. And that, for me, gave me a, a measure of... Uh, of less anxiety, I would say. So those are, that I would get that if that happens. Then as a, a supervisor, um, so for employees that, that don't have COVID, I think the best advice I would give is demand uh, that they wear a mask and, lim and limit physical distancing. I know we are, but I think we need to, to lead by example because I think that's the, the best thing that we can do and, and, and how we can control the spread of this. So, um, I would, I would recommend that we all lead by example in that, re, in that respect. And then encourage employees, you know, to keep fighting the good fight, you know, continue to, uh, as we work from home to, uh, uh, you know, drown out the, the Zoom fatigue and, uh, and, and continue to do the social distancing and all the right things. And then if, uh, if you have an employee with, uh, with COVID, um, the best thing that, that I found was helpful was the reassurance. You know, it's important to, to let your, your direct reports and people you work with know that you care. And Bob did this with me when he found out, he would kind of check in and ask how I was feeling each day. And um, uh, Dr. Crawford, our new VCR, uh, when she found out, um, it was just some simple words to say, make sure you take care of yourself, make sure you get enough rest. And that also gave me the ability to, um, to say it's okay to rest and it's okay to take some, some time when I needed it. Um, and then the regular check-ins, just let, you know, let people know that you, you care, um, is, it's very, very comforting. And then if you wanna send a care package, as we heard from Dr. Uh, uh, Carver, I think um, that it also lifts the spirits. So that's all I had for you today. And, and, um, and I hope that helps uh, as you in, in, engage this uh, disease in the future. Thank you. Back to you, David. Right, great. Thank you, Bruce. You want to go ahead and stop the screen sharing and I'll jump on that. All right, we're going to switch a little bit of gears here and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my experience as the Dean of College of Graduate Studies at MTSU. I wear two titles. Uh, one is Dean and one is Vice Provost, but in particular, I'm going to talk to you uh, wearing my Dean's hat today. So October 2019 through February 2020, uh, I was very busy patting myself on the back about doing some great work. We actually were up 20% year over year for new applications. This was a deliberate effort over 18 months to get the right people, processes, and technology in place. And so everything was going great. Our numbers were running good. And it's like, finally, the system is coming together as it's supposed to. It was almost a perfect case study. And then all of a sudden, COVID uncertainty starts kicking in. And then after that, I start following my uh, daily numbers and I see this declining trend. So as the news of uncertainty starts going up, all of a sudden I saw all of our gains go down to where we were and then start having a negative return. And at that time, I said, uh-uh, <laughs> not on my watch. We worked too hard uh, to get this uh, in the right direction. So we had to come together and do a pivot. So here on the left, I'll sort of walk you through uh, what we collectively came up with as I was walking around the office and talking to everyone was people are feeling vulnerable. 
uh, people will, and these are would be applicants, people are fairly feeling uncertain. People are having a hard time making a decision in uncertainty. Whenever you, whenever people don't know the progression of the disease, they don't know the impact on the economy, they don't know the impact on their job. There was this almost freeze uh, to inaction. Uh, investment in a graduate application may be risky. Even you know, thirty-five or forty dollars uh, may not seem like a lot, but all of a sudden, if you're not sure about your employment status, that may you know pay for a week's worth of food. And then, and new international students were unlikely to make it to campus. So all of a sudden, our international uh, applicants and recruits, you know, which could make up to 10% of our population, we knew were not coming in both the COVID and also due to some of the challenges happening in DC at the time. So uh, knowing those uh, situations, we made some determinations. Uh, we decided to make the graduate application and graduate school more certain. So how do we move from uncertainty to certainty? And one of the things we did is we removed the traditional barriers to entry. Number one is the GRE and GMAT. We worked with all our graduate program directors and said, you know, th this is a barrier. Uh, ETS is not offering some of these exams. Are you willing to do a one semester waiver of these given the circumstances? It was happening across the country. And so there was agreement within the university. Almost every program chose to do that. Additionally, uh, that helped lower the stress for our applicants and lower the uncertainty principle. As we're also aware that the financial costs associated with application may be a barrier, we decided to move the application fee from $35 to $1. And we thought of this as almost like a coupon or a sale. As you see sales declining in the retail area, you have to advertise, you have to do coupons, a BOGO, whatever it is, to drive it up. So we use the same similar process here, move our application to $1 to help reduce that risk and uh, help increase um, the visibility. And then obviously we, we made these changes, we had to get the word out. So we broadcast these through our marketing channels that we had established. Let me explain to you what you're looking at here. You see the dates down here, two March, all the way through 19 May on the uh, horizontal axis. The vertical axis is number of applications we have compared to the same time last year. So if it's negative, if you look here on eight March, we had fewer applications on 8 March than we did uh, the same day for 2020 than we did for 19. So anytime it's above the thing, there were more applications below, we had fewer. And you'll see here in March, we started having a lot of these negative trend numbers, in particular from March 11th you know, down to the 22nd, we were trending negative. So when we waive the GRE requirement, you'll see in the green, you'll see that did do a little bit of positive bump, you know, one April, through 18 April, we got a positive bump. But when we combine that with the $1 graduate application fee and broadcast that, our numbers spiked. So it wasn't just one item, it was a combination of two things that really got the word out that helped reduce those barriers of entry and our barriers of application to come in and drew our numbers and our applications up. So remember, this is March and April. How do we know this was an effect related to those two items and getting the word out? If you look at this data, this is going back to 2017, 2018, 2019, the same period. You'll see actually April and May is kind of a lull time for us for graduate applications. It's not a very high peak. We have uh, distinct peak periods and this is definitely not it. So as you're looking through 17, 18, 19, and then here we are in 20, where we put these items into place, not only did it give us this big spike highlight on the right, but a continuous growth overall onto the right uh, beyond that, continuing beyond that, uh, uh, that cycle. So what we realized is these two things did help produce a, a type of more certainty than was, and we helped to help offset some of the declines that we saw encroaching in in February and March. So what are sort of the lessons learned here, sort of a case study? Number one, have your pulse on the daily data. If I did not have daily data coming into my inbox every day, I would not have noticed the trend when it started to decline and realized there was something amiss. One or two days is different, three or four starts becoming concerning. You have to know the past trends to know what expect uh, the future trends are. In other words, if you see three or four days of downward decline, unless you know what it looked like historically, then you don't know if that is an anomaly or not. So you have to know the past data, and keep your pulse on current data. Once you see something changing, you have to respond 
fast and early in that response. So we were able to come together, see the trend, and then make decisions in March. Even though March is sort of when the university wasn't sure what they're gonna do, if we're gonna close or not, we were already taking proactive uh, messaging all the way out to our would-be applicants. In a negative environment, we try to create an alternative positive narrative. We went through more thesaurus words than we could think possible, trying to find all these words of what's gonna happen, uncertain, unhealthy, and turn those into positive, affirmative, uh, self-reinforcing uh, words. We also decided working against the trends in counter-cyclical mass movements. So a lot of universities were sort of, uh, across the nation were sort of hunkering down, pulling in. We decided to broadcast outward instead, do something the opposite of what others are doing. And the last thing I think that, and a big takeaway, and that's the reason for the Stretch Armstrong, if you don't know what that is, 1970s uh, toy there, uh, is that prior to um, this period, there was this expectation of their graduate school applicants, you meet them halfway, it's part of their journey, they have to earn their way, et cetera. What we realized is when people are fearful, when they're uncertain, when they're not sure what's gonna happen to their life, their safety, think about Bruce's presentation, you know, survival of himself and family is number one. You know, thinking about graduate application is uh, something different down the road is putting more certainty into that and going beyond halfway, going beyond three quarters, go as far as possible to that person for that handshake, for that acceptance, for that assurance is what was needed to get those numbers up. And that's something we've continued uh, all the way through uh, moving forward. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and then turn it over to Frank to continue and share his screen. Can you see that? I can't, I'm having trouble on my end. Sorry about that. Yes, we can see it. Oh, cool. Well, thanks, Bruce um, and uh, David. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is how we engage and connect students in, in this era of COVID and um, when all of us had to pivot and move very quickly from a space where our students are on our campus to our students are hybrid partly on campus, some living at home, some living on campus. And one of the, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our experiences here at Knoxville campus in terms of how we try to connect and engage with students in an environment to keep them uh, uh, still part of the volunteer experience, still part of what makes Rocky Top special. Um, so I want to just highlight a little bit about some of our, some of the things we did this past spring and also leading up into the fall semester. Um, hopefully I can advance this without much of an issue. Can you see if I advanced? I'm trying to, there we go. When we shifted and pivoted last spring, in, in the months of, basically from April, March to the end of May, we wanted to make sure that our students, when they left campus and we sent everyone home, that they still remain connected because recognizing that their experiences were critical for them to return and their success to be able to come back by, uh, in the fall semester. So a lot of our programming, shifted to virtual just like on many of your campuses in the march through april time period we held some 130 different virtual events around diversity and inclusion engagement uh, sexual assault uh, healthy minds and wellness really to keep students feel connected to the campus the other thing that tied into this is that we talked to our housing staff and we worked with each of the resident assistants were in the hall, and now all of a sudden they became virtual RAs. It didn't matter if their residents were in Memphis or if the residents were in uh, New Jersey or in Florida or in Knoxville, all of our RAs were asked to help keep connected with their students and to help keep connected um, to email, check in regularly, plan activities um, as if they were living on the same floor. So that helped keep students engaged and it really started us rethinking of how we connect uh, with our students. We continued 
uh, to offer uh, appointments and tutoring. Our colleagues in, in student success continue to offer services for students. And um, our counseling and our student services, because students were still paying fees, like many of our, our, our campuses, students were asking what are, what's happening to the types of services they're, they're receiving off of the student fees. We moved, you can see in this time period, we held almost a thousand counseling sessions. Um, and um, we continue to receive 974 help uh, calls where we were help fielding reports from students who were either in crisis or students who just didn't know where to turn to for support. And um, we assisted some 400 students through our student emergency fund. I wanna talk a little bit later about our emergency fund because when we, when we shifted and pretty much the entire country shut down in March, we looked around and realized that we had $8,000 in our student emergency fund, in our student life student emergency fund. And um, we quickly, through our colleagues in advancement and development, were able to grow that um, to almost $300,000. And um, we've been able to date well over four, actually that number is more like 500 now that we've been able to assist students with some level of support um, uh, of uh, providing assistance. That 160,000 awarded thus far was from earlier this, this summer prior to the start of the fall semester. Recognizing and going to the summer, we wanted to make sure that our students were, would come back to campus. So we implemented a number of things to tr try to keep our students engaged. And one of the most ambitious things that we did as a campus is that an idea that came out of our colleagues between student enrollment, uh, student success and student life was, why don't we call all of our students? So we started a massive calling campaign. Um, uh, we directed a lot of our staff in, in different areas and we started calling all of our students, checking in on them, finding out what assistance they needed, finding out what support we could provide and just thanking them for being part of Rocky Top and, and saying, we're here for you when you come back and we want you to come back and, and to answer any questions that they might have. And I think because of those efforts in keeping students connected, that they're part of Rocky Top, they're part of the experience here, uh, helps provide that connection that, to want, make them want to come back. And I believe it really led to, um, to our highest retention rate that we've received this, thus far um, among our first to second year students from spring to fall. One of the things we also learned from this um, experience is that Gen Z students, we would think are built for online education. They've had an experience of dealing with technology their entire lives, um, but our students still crave human connection and still crave an experience of having either face-to-face, -face, whether it be a classroom or it might be a program or an event or, or, or what have you. So as we started the fall semester, prior to the start of the fall semester, excuse me, one of the emphasis that we started to really think about was how do we help continue student engagement when you have 6,000 students living on campus and many more living in the surrounding community area of campus, how do we get them engaged, connected with one another? Because we know they're gonna to want to re-engage when they come back outside of just Zoom appointments and Zoom meetings. Uh, many of their meetings were still going to be held online via Zoom. Many of their events were going to have to be shifted to, to online virtual events. So we wanted to offer our students a combination of hybrid, but also some in-person activities to be able to give them the ability to connect with one another. I want to highlight a couple of things that I think were very successful for us. In the very beginning, when our students arrived, uh, one of our most popular things we started doing was we, we started doing these drive-in movies. We did these drive-in movies in our parking lots, uh, wherever we can get, or in the Union Plaza, wherever we could uh, have students gather safely distance, and, and, and we marked off different areas where people can, can watch uh, a movie together with their peers. During recognizing that the academic semester had been changed quite differently, and we had no longer had a, homecom a traditional homecoming event, we partnered with our colleagues in alumni affairs and sponsored a spirit week to engage students to have a, 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 a summer semblance of a homecoming, but also since because we also didn't have a fall break, to have events and activities really geared to give students that mental health break that they needed. 
because of our limited capacity in our, in our uh, stadium seating and the number of student tickets available, we recreated a game day experience for our students. We set up a field uh, and uh, broadcast um, on the Jumbotron the game and have free food. And again, students were able to make reservations as a group of other two to four friends and sit safely distance apart and watch a game in an outdoor setting. As we started to put more and more students in quarantine housing or students who needed to quarantine, we recognized that those students needed support and uh, connections as well. So we started a program called Quarantine with the Dean. Our Dean of Students uh, would have these virtual sessions where students could come in. It could be a chat, it could be a game or what have you, and students would win prizes. And some of them were um, food delivery prizes that we would get food delivered to wherever they were in quarantine housing. Because we wanted to see our students engage and see them more in person, we also started doing, uh, we reinstituted our Milkshake Mondays where students on, in the plaza on every Monday, our Dean of Students would hand out free um, milkshakes to students uh, on, um, in an outdoor setting. They could just come up and, and, and hand those out. And then we started a program, um, I started a program to, for not only our students, but our staff in terms of tr traditional office hours where you wouldn't be able to have that experience going out and set up a place where we could talk to our staff or our students about what was on their mind, any concerns they might have. Um, uh, their staff jokingly called it kicking it with Quavis, so we went all over and we either handed out food or just sat and talked about checking in with people, how their experiences were on campus. That it looked a lot different. What could we do to provide them with a different um, experience, but also help them feel connected to the university environment? recognizing that we were also dealing with a number of social justice issues. Our focus also was around creating that sense of space for our students where we provided to do an environment where we could give our students a space to, to share with us their concerns, to share with us what we could do to make and improve um, the campus climate so that we can become a place where truly everyone matters and everyone belongs. And we continued, we did a number of programs in person uh, around the um, inclusion, around equity, inclusion, and engagement, focusing on areas of, uh, as a, gearing up towards the election. We did a number of things gearing up towards the election, but also on rocky topics around creating our, sp our community that is more inclusive, more caring, and supportive for all of our students, um, and planning a number of workshops that were hybrid. Some were done in person and some were uh, uh, virtual in environments by bringing in a, a number of speakers. All with the goal is to give a sense of space for our students to really to process the events that were happening this summer uh, and, the, and how do we make uh, the conversation and moving the campus forward around areas of equity and inclusion. One of the things that Bruce talked about early on with his own experience with COVID is that there are a number of different challenges that our families and our students were facing. And we wanted to approach an, an environment of creating a space of compassionate care and compassionate service for our students. So we quickly were planned to make sure that had already started some plans this summer that we were addressing some of our needs with our students to provide resources for them, more than just resources, but also some important services. We um, continued with our Smokey's Closet, which is uh, um, professional clothing for our students who needed it, who were either preparing for perhaps an internship that, that were still occurring. Many of them were done virtually, but for those that were occurring face to face. And then we were actually kicked off and opened our Big Orange Pantry this fall. Um, and I'm pleased to share that today we've assisted almost two. We opened it much later uh, than we had planned because of some construction delays. But um, I, today we've shared, we've assisted well of almost 200 students, uh, had over 50 people volunteer. And it's a partnership between Student Life, our friends and alumni in development and um, social college and a couple of different colleges. Again, to provide students an opportunity right now, even during COVID, they can schedule um, and go shopping online and we'll have bags ready available for them even during this break right now when students are no longer on our campus but for those who are in the vicinity who are still living here 
who need food, who need assistance, we, we don't want our students to go hungry, so we provide that service to them. And, for, and we also have opened the pantry up for our staff as well. And then I did mention our, our uh, Vols Help Vols Student Emergency Fund. Uh, that continues to be an area in the need because as our students and their families are struggling, wanting to pr provide a resource where we can provide assistance to students uh, with other needs that may not be traditionally met through our scholarship offerings. Um, and our, again, our alumni and development staff have been very helpful in helping secure donor gifts to be able to grow that from $8,000 to well over $300,000 as we've been able to provide assistance to a number of students during these difficult times and continuing those services because we know that as the spring semester comes around, um, we will, there will be continued need for all of our students and their families. Um, and many of them may or may not be working depending on things that um, might be happening in our communities as governments and health boards uh, make decisions uh, and what's best for the community health care. Those are just some of the things we did to try to engage our students and provide services for them during this um, pandemic period in time. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, see, I can't remember. Hey, thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. And then once you uh, stop sharing, Stephen will uh, jump in with his. All right. All right, Stephen, floor is yours. Okay. One second. It's okay. showing on our screen. Sorry? The first slide is up there. <clears throat> Do you see it? Yes. Okay. All right, guys. Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Gentile. I am Chief Policy Officer of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Um, and I, although I started my career working on a college campus, and I, I miss working on a college campus, I, I love that time. Um, I spent the last uh, eight months kind of watching everything from afar, um, having a lot of sympathy for everything that's happening. Um, on your campuses as you as you are forced to deal with um, this pandemic and I know that all of you uh, must be <laughs> exhausted right now um, and ready for about three more weeks of a Thanksgiving break if you can get that um, you guys have put up with a lot I know that um, what we have been able to do here at TEC. I mean, there's a good part of our agency that has been on the road, with Mike Krause being one of them, our executive director, and Emily House, our deputy director, um, coordinating functions across institutions in response. Uh, we've also been able to take a seat back and think through, all right, what's, what's changed on campuses that might be done for the long haul, for the future? And Late October, um, Dr. Emily House and I convened a group of uh, professionals from across our state, our institutions, community colleges, TCATs, universities, and systems to discuss well, what is the future of higher education? Um, what are lessons that we learned in this transition due to COVID uh, that we shouldn't lose? Bottom line, we can't return to February 2020. That is not an option. Um, right before the pandemic. Higher education is going to be changed forever. Uh, and so what will we do? What's going to look like in the future? Um, and then Director Mike Krause, Executive Director Mike Krause, he presented on some of these findings to the commission back in early November. I'm going to go into a high-level overview for you right now, what we observed from across the state and talking to these professionals. This mentality of we can't go back to February 2020 um, is rooted in this quote, Never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, who coined this? Uh, was in Churchill, Rahm Emanuel, um, everybody between March 2020 and June 2020 um, coined this as well. I heard this every time I turned on a webinar, uh, came to this group, Bob Smith, you, you brought this up. Um, this is definitely an often repeated uh, phrase. I, I've got to admit, I've had, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with this phrase. Um, hate is strong, but I think when I first heard it, I was wincing a bit, knowing that this pandemic was bringing a lot of pain. 
didn't want to minimize it um, in the hopes of changing higher education love because it's, it's adequate. There's a lot in higher education that we could make better. Um, and this pandemic has allowed us to open our eyes to it. So thinking through that, that's, that's suggesting that something with higher education was broken. Uh, I believe that we have the best higher education system in the world. Um, the United States is, is well known for its higher education. Um, uh, it's elite. Uh, it, it really does transform the lives. However, there are cracks that we, we should focus on. So what was broken? Well, this is a picture of a higher education classroom from the last turn of the century. Notice it's a lecture hall uh, with some, some uh, teachers in the background there, um, posed well. Uh, this is from, I believe, the mid to late 1970s, um, another lecture hall, um, faculty member in the front of the classroom. Uh, this is a mid 2010s, so about five years ago, a little nicer lecture hall, some more technology, but very much looks the same. Higher education, at least in our public institutions and most of our private institutions, was focused on the in-person contact, the in-person student, the quote unquote traditional student. This bled over into um, processes um, on campus, financial aid. You have to go to campus, on campus, to meet with your financial aid counselor. Uh, you have to go on campus to uh, register. Yeah, you have to do a lot of things on campus because that's how we thought of higher education. By the way, I don't know if this is true for you, but seeing this picture here in front of me gives me hives to see people so close together. And I think there's a guy coughing um, in the front row. Um, so a lot has changed and we can't go back to this time. So when we met with our professionals, what happened when higher ed stepped out of the classroom? Um, Frank, you went into a lot of the details I'm about to go into because of course we heard these themes resonate beyond UT and other institutions, but there are some big key takeaways. First of all, online education um, has made permanent seismic progress in the last eight months. This is no shock to anyone, but what we've seen are faculty and staff be able to be more flexible than they have been in the past to run parallel tracks of in-person online courses, perhaps offer hybrid opportunities for students to work um, if they want to come to on campus or if they want to be away from campus or if they're quarantined um, to be able to go in and out of the classroom in an easy and seamless way. Um, I should mention, by the way, that three of the members of this phone call were also in this group um, that looked at the future of higher ed. David Butler, Jacqueline from Southwest, and then Bo from Chattanooga State um, were in on this call as well. And Jacqueline, she brought up the fact that um, Southwest uh, Tennessee Community College has long been a Chromebook uh, community college. Um, they've had Chromebooks for their students for a very long time, before the pandemic. However, it took the pandemic for them to realize that some of their offerings, their course offerings, how they connected with students, did not work in a Chromebook way, Chromebook manner. So they had this great technology, but they weren't using it adequately. This transition of the last eight months forced them to better understand that. And then David Butler mentioned um, that Banner, apparently, uh, was able to do things that people didn't think Banner could do. Um, as Mike Krause mentioned to um, uh, the TEC Leadership Fellows over a year ago, uh, we can't let Banner rule us. At the same time, we need to recognize that Banner, you know, it's, it's, it might be inflexible, but it can be used uh, in a helpful way. So think about this online future. What does this mean? Uh, can we better meet the needs of our students who don't uh, see themselves as traditionally on-campus students? Can we reach students where they are? Uh, can we compete better with, say, proprietary institutions? Uh, proprietary institutions, love them or hate them, I think most people hate them, um, from, who, who are from uh, public and private institutions, but what they're very good at doing is meeting students where they are. So here's an academic calendar. By the way, I think it was Jacqueline who also said in this group, can we abandon the academic calendar? Here's an academic calendar from, I believe, Damar College is where I got this from, from well before the pandemic. This is just two terms, so I don't have here in front of you summer and spring. But if you look at this calendar, you see that halfway through the fall, they have a fall mid-start or a whole new course section. Halfway through the winter, they have a winter mid-start. They've been able to make their courses more flexible to meet the needs of the students who are just coming in mid-fall and say, you know what, I really do want to sign up for college college course. 
Does the change we see from the pandemic, will that carry forward and help institutions be more flexible, public institutions be more flexible to working adults by having a more flexible calendar? Other observations, user-friendly processes, going back to that photo I showed of financial aid um, lines, um, forcing students to come on campus instead of actually dealing with the processes online. Uh, we heard a, a great change to removing paper processes and going and allowing students to do appeals, refunds online. We heard a lot about purge dates. So purging students from classes who weren't showing up or didn't pay their fees to be in the classroom. Uh, a couple of institutions mentioned, you know what, we set this purge date mainly as a convenience to staff so that there is a set time where they can just push the button and purge everyone. And there was also convenience for those who are on the wait list. Maybe two or three students could access that course uh, if we purged at a certain time. But you purged more than two to three students to allow those waitlisted students to come on. Perhaps it is better interest of the students who are in that class to give more time, more communication before purging. Uh, because the pandemic brought on a lot of confusion for everyone, institutions were much more flexible and they discovered, you know what, we can do this on our campus. And then meeting students where they are if they're outside of the classroom. Um, Frank went into this with UT Knoxville, and I loved hearing this. I heard this from ETSU representative on the call as well. Um, we convene our group. Um, taking all these traditional services outside of the processes, but like student mental health, um, counseling, and putting those on to an online format, uh, or holding concerts and guest lectures online. We heard more of this and why this stood out to me is because if you're a commuter student who thinks of yourself as going to UT Martin uh, for the few classes that you have that day and maybe sticking around for some uh, work study or other options that will get you home around five o'clock, you're gonna miss out on all these afternoon evening lectures that are outside of your normal academic experience. But what they discovered at ETSU when this came up on our calls, like, you know what, we can actually provide a virtual platform for those students post-pandemic to engage with these offerings. So implications. Uh, when I heard Frank's presentation earlier today and when I heard um, this, the Future of Higher Ed Working Group come together, these two men came to mind. Uh, the one on the left is Vincent Tinto. Um, and he uh, is a sociologist out of Syracuse. And the one on the right is John Braxton. He's a professor I had at Vanderbilt University for two of my uh, graduate programs there. And, and both of these men uh, spend a lot of their career thinking about student retention and completion of the students. And I'm not gonna go through this graph right here thoroughly with you right now, but uh, this is a student integration model from 1993. Tinto first proposed this at the young age of 27 in 1977, I believe, um, thinking through all the characteristics that influence completion of a student. Um, and, and of course, you've got uh, characteristics of students before they come in, so whether they're prepared um, for their college experience. But the things that have always stood out to me are how the students perceive the institution's commitment to their own welfare. So does the institution care about me? And then also social integration. Does that student feel like they are socially integrated into the community? That outside of the classroom, they are somebody on that campus. And so when we convened this group a month and a half ago, and then hearing again, Frank mentioned um, all the ways you're connecting with your students, I keep going back to this model. It's like, wow, we're finding ways to connect with students who are quote unquote, not traditional. Those students who will be remote in the future, perhaps we found a way to actually connect with them and help better socially integrate those students into our campus. Or when students are having a bad time or have to go um, away from campus, be quarantined, or after the pandemic, need to take some time off mid-semester to be able to uh, get some money or care for a loved one. The flexibility we've shown these last eight months will really help show the students that institutions care about them and care about their welfare. Institutions always have 
But by being flexible and utilizing the tools that we have in front of us, I think that'll be more apparent going forward. So my hope is that this holds post COVID. That said, I know that's much easier for me to be able to say um, here and not be on the ground because I know everyone is very exhausted from all you've had to do in the last eight months. Um, but going forward, I would love to think through with you, email me, you can call me um, as well anytime to think through how we can sustain this for the future. Um, again, the utmost flexibility that we have. All right, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Bruce and Frank and Stephen all for presenting today. I want to thank Bob for giving us a platform by which we can share our lessons learned as we're moving forward. And I want to thank the audience for the uh, spectacular turnout. So with that, Bob, you have uh, four minutes remaining. I'll turn the floor over to you. Actually, I might pick it up for a quick closing. Um, special thank you to all of you and the representatives from both ELI and the Leadership Fellows. It's great to see the cohort and also to have the blended effect. Um, I really applaud those of you, our presenters, for reaching out and being willing to share what you've learned. And we hope that we will have more of these sessions. So uh, if you're willing to step up and uh, show your learning or your expertise in whatever way, we certainly welcome that. Um, and I obviously hope that this spurs communication between you off of this format as well. Um, with that, Bob, I'll pass to you. So thank you. Well, I'm going to first uh, see if there's any questions that anybody wants to ask. We'll steal a few minutes to uh, follow up. I'll tell you what an eclectic set of presentations uh, covered a lot of points. Anybody just jump in. Don't raise your hand. Just do like you've done in the past. Just interrupt. Bob, I have a question for my classmate Bruce. Thank you so much for sort of sharing your challenges as you journey through COVID. Um, since we're sort of steeped in leadership, I'm curious to know how, how you personally and directly going through COVID has maybe changed your or modified or adjusted your leadership style? Uh, thanks, Melissa. That's a, that's a great point. So, you know, I think throughout the presentations, you know, we heard about compassion as being something that's very, very important as we go through these times. And, um, and I find uh, that I think I'm much more compassionate uh, toward those who are struggling, whether they've had COVID or just dealing with um, the new normal. Um, you know, in my group, I have someone who has a, an elderly parent that they take, you know, take care of. And, um, and occasionally we do our, our meetings in person, separated by social distance. But, you know, this experience for me made me realize, you know, just make him feel at home and say, stay home. We're, we'll, we'll go all teleworking, for example. So um, I think that's the biggest thing. And, um, and then you know, it's made me realize that uh, the little personal touches, you know, I found out about a couple, couple of other colleagues that recently uh, had the diagnosis and, um, and just like Bob did with me, just reaching out, to, you know, every day, every other day to see how they're doing, um, see, is very encouraging. So I think from a leadership standpoint, it's just, uh, you know, turn up the compassion and, and just be more aware. Stephen, I'll throw a question to you. You pulled together a group of people early on. Is there any plan that you're going to pull another group? Yes, we, we do have plans to do that. We have not set a time and place to do it, but uh, to be honest, uh, we got through one hour of that time. We're very respectful of time uh, for everyone who's on campus. Um, and we realized that conversation could probably go on uh, a few more hours. Uh, so we do plan to convene that group again. Good, good. Well, um, all right, having said that, I caught the hint that we're at the end of the hour and we want to be respectful of your time as well. Uh, I want to introduce Mike Gregory, who uh, is uh, 
in the photo that apparently was taken as part of a military training project. I've seen that, that framework a lot. Mike is uh, the new Ron Treadway for the Executive Leadership Institute. For those of you who know that uh, Ron retired in, in August and uh, much as I had compelled uh, Ron to be part of the program, I reached out and thanks to uh, Tiffany Carpenter and some other people, uh, Mike's joining us. And uh, we're not real sure when we're gonna be doing uh, or starting the next cohort. I'll tell you that uh, at this point, I'm thinking it's probably gonna be May or June before the, we do that. I've been encouraged by these uh, rollouts for the vaccinations, but I've been deeply, deeply discouraged by the lack of accepting personal responsibility across the state that has kept a lot of us uh, inside. Um, it's interesting, did you notice in today's news that uh, in Great Britain, they had 30 days of pretty much a severe shutdown and they have had a 30% drop in cases as a consequence of just everybody hanging together for a short period of time. Uh, this country doesn't seem to be interested in that kind of short-term sacrifice for the long term, and it's affecting us. Uh, I mean, not only mentally as indicated here, but also in our ability to kind of push forward with the program. I think there's something to be said about leadership there. On December the 11th, uh, there is going to be a really pretty extraordinary program as a follow-up to this. And as, as great as you four were, and thank you, thank you, thank you very much for what you put on here. I think you're going to find that our two speakers are going to uh, be equally valuable to you. So thank you all for participating with us uh, here uh, with that uh, we're concluded to enjoy it and uh, see you on December the 11th. Thank you all.